to you from the Seaport District at Pier 17. All right, let's try this again, Sarah Spain. The longest winning streak in the NFC <laughs> right now. Not the Detroit Lions because they haven't won in a year, but nobody. It's nobody. No <laughs> NFC team won. has currently won two games in a row. This is incomprehensible to me. In the AFC, Titans six straight, Patriots four, Kansas City three, Indy and Miami two in a row. Those are the only streaks in the NFL right now. So a question, who's the number one team in the league? What are the Clinton Yates power rankings? Right now, I will go to where somebody else on this panel lives, and I will say the Dallas Cowboys. They absolutely hammered the Falcons. I think when that team puts it all together, they are the best team, at least right now in the league. They got three games coming up in a 12-game span, though, so they'll have to prove it. But for me, it's the Stars. That's Tim Kalishaw. Well, I think they're close. The Denver game is a little fresh in my mind. I'm going to go with the Green Bay Packers because the defense they're playing is the best of the NFC contenders. But I will say we kind of sleep on the AFC even though the AFC's got 12 teams, 500 or better, and the NFC's got seven. AFC's just beating well, up on each other. whose fault is that? Why aren't you talking about the AFC there, Galusha? <laughs> Sarah Spain, who's number one in the Spain rankings? Uh, worthy competitors, both of those, but I'm still going with the Cardinals. I think we've lost the luster because Kyler Murray's been out, but this is a team that we know has an explosive offense, and then it's number four in overall defense, number three in takeaways. When they get Kyler and D-Hop and everybody, that's still my favorite. Julie. Good answer. Yeah, I'm with Sarah, and I'm going to lead into my boss or homerism here, but watch out for the Patriots. The last four weeks, their defense has looked really good. They're switching from a zone coverage, uh, from a man coverage scheme to a zone coverage scheme. Mac, Mac Jones has looked awesome over the course okay. of the last couple of right. weeks. He's really been improving. I'm asking at the who's number position. one in the entire league. I'm not asking who's pretty good. All fine answers you gave. How did nobody go to the Tennessee Titans? You know what they've done during their six game winning streak? Anybody? They've beaten five playoff teams from last year. Where is that in your answer? They've done that a lot without Derrick Henry and Julio Jones. Where is that? If I was making an argument on an international television show, that might be a place to go. Although you all had very good answers. We'll move on. Buy or sell two, Zion Williamson clear for contact. One-on-one -on -one drills first, then team play. Tim, is this actual good news here for Zion and the Falcons? It's, it's barely good news. I mean, they've, they've had such a rough start. They don't seem like they're going to contend uh, this year. It's, at the end of his rookie year, that was going to be a team to watch. And now it's going to feel like two wasted years. You wonder how long he's even going to be in Spain. It's very sad. I believe the phrase is, you have to walk before you can run and then do a five-man scrimmage and then get back in the game. So, yeah, it's good news. I mean, we still have a while to wait. I don't have expectations for this team, but let's take what we sure. can get here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a step forward. Uh, Kenneth Buckner, I thought, really had a really good call in the Washington Post today, talking about the conversation around Zion and his weight and his health, uh, and how a lot of people have been kind of mean about Zion and his weight and how, how kind of the, the, the discourse that has happened around that. That being said, uh, Zion, what makes him special is the fact that he's able to play at that size and have that athleticism. And so I think it's a situation where we kind of have to be you know, careful about this, you know, the way that we talk about Zion and his health because it is ultimately what separates him from the rest of the NBA. Yeah, I think it's good news because for this organization overall, they've got major issues. People fighting downstairs in arenas between former coaches and GMs and stuff like that. For the fact that he's motivated enough to try to get back on the court with this team specifically is huge for the Pels because he might want to get that out of there because they ain't been doing so great recently. Buy or sell three, check this home field advantage out. This is next level. Canada, Mexico, World Cup qualifying environmental advantage. It was 16 degrees, there was snow in Edmonton. Oh. Canada taking down Mexico in a huge win. USMNT and Jamaica drawing a draw. Jamaica had a goal disallowed late, <laughs> so maybe it's the USMNT escaping with a draw. Anytime we can get a point away from home is a good thing. You always hear people say it. Greg Berhalter actually said it yesterday. Sarah, is a draw in Jamaica a good thing for the US men's national team? It's a fine thing. It's not a good thing. The expectations should be higher for this team. You get that big win against Mexico. The goal should be to be a contender, not just to eke your way into the World Series, knowing the sports industrial complex of this country and our resources. Now, it is a series, so, no, of course, but more. they're playing for the Cup in the World Cup. Uh, June Lee, how about you? 
Yeah, I think that the standard has to be higher for these U.S. men's national team, especially if they want to make it to the next World Cup. You know, I think it was really good that Timothy Weah showed up last night and had, had, a, had a goal in that game. Uh, but the U.S. national team looked flat in the second half. And Jamaica should have won that game, and they would have won that game if there was video action replay on, 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 that, uh, on that goal that was disallowed. So, uh, you know, kind of a you know, mixed bag, but I think the U.S. men's national team, we need to expect more out of them. why? Getting a road point in CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers is always an accomplishment, but can we get back to the Canadians? This team is tremendous right now. My man Fonso Davies, if they get back to the World Cup for the first time since like the 80s, that'll be tremendous. They are atop the CONCACAF uh, well, qualifiers Well, they play in the right snow now. every game. That would be great, too. Tim yeah. Kalish, how about you? I'm going to say it's a good point, not just because it's on the road like Clinton said, but because that goal you showed Sure looks like it should have counted for Jamaica with six minutes to go. I'm not sure they didn't, you know, get get a real break there with that call because there was no replay. Buy or sell four. Best story in the show today. Staples Center naming rights bought out. It'll be Crypto.com Arena for the next 20 years starting on Christmas Day. What a present to all of us. Here is, well, a friend of ours, Bill Plasky. Staples wasn't some historical figure or pioneer. Just an office supply store, but it was a good, solid arena name, and it stuck. It was Kobe Staples. It was Shaq Staples. <laughs> now the identity's gone, he says. June Lee, buy or sell Crypto.com Arena. I sell it. I actually made a TikTok about this this morning, about the top five worst stadium names. <laughs> and this came in at number one because the dot-com part of this takes it to another level of just like, why? You know, like, Staples Center has like the rhythm, it's two syllables, crypto.com is four syllables. It just doesn't flow as much, in my opinion. Um, I think it's right up there with like- So you're worried about this from a flow level, okay? Clinton Yates, you're in Los Angeles. What are you hearing on the ground? <laughs> I mean, if it's going to be Kobe Staples, that means it's also, I don't know, Kwame Brown Staples, Chris Mim Staples, Smush Parker oh, Staples. Okay, I mean, listen, right. we can get away. We can get away from that. But my point is, nobody's outside right now lamenting the loss of the name. It's a cool building. They've had some great moments, and that will continue to happen. Well, Bill Flashkey's <laughs> lamenting the loss of the Staples Center. So yeah. you had your office supply center name, and now you have your cryptocurrency name, Tim Kalisha. How does it play? Look, no one loves going to the office supply store, picking up some printer ink more than I do, but I think he's a little <laughs> off base here. I mean, it's not like they changed the name of Dodger Stadium. It's not like they changed the name of Fenway Park. They changed the name of the Staples Center. That's okay. Sarah Speed. Yeah, he described himself as lost, which is too much, he, well, right? It's, it's, again, it's only 22 years of a name. It's not Wrigley Field. It's not Fenway. But as someone who still will not call the Sears Tower anything but the Sears Tower, sometimes we just have our buildings, and we want to stay loyal to what we do. Have any of you guys used a staple in the last five years? An actual staple. I used oh, one absolutely. yesterday on radio. Yes. yes. Yesterday. Staples. Yes. Stapled, yes. You stapled something recently? Yeah. Papers. Yes. I stapled the script together for a different show. Spain, lead, showdown. Two minutes. Let's go around the horn. Responsibly. Talishaw, Sarah Spain, June Lee. Look at that battle. MVP chance in Brooklyn last night for Steph Curry. Right in the face Ooh. of Durant. What Golden State showed and what Brooklyn didn't. Today on Crypto.com, around the horn, hashtag take point. Arena Stadium. Here we go. How about that? How about you getting points now? You guys get crypto points. That's that's the story of the show, all right? We'll get to that in a second. Seth was hitting everything last night, even the ones that didn't count. You were wondering how real this start is for Golden State now 12 2. Last night's second half and how they pulled away from Brooklyn goes a long way. Steve Nash about Brooklyn said, I don't think we're at the Warriors category yet. So we'll start with this national panel. Yesterday we wondered if this was a finals preview, but just the Warriors. Tim Kalashar, are you beginning to think the Warriors are finals favorites? I think it was half a finals preview. <laughs> we had one of those teams that way. out there. And the Warriors did what they've been doing, which is owning the third quarter. They went from 30 seconds to go in the half, down one, to two minutes into the second half, up 13. And they've been doing that to people. It's like... It's like Jake Gyllenhaal got obliterated for 10 minutes by a number one powerhouse the other night on Saturday Night Live. That's what's happening to the Warriors opponents every week or every game when they play these teams. And it wasn't all Curry, who was great. He was 9 for 14 on threes. 
but Andrew Wiggins is the one in that stretch, yeah. and he's become a different player. He had 10 points in that 14-0 run. They just have too many weapons. Finals favorite, Kalashaw. Finals favorite, Golden State. It sounds yes. like you're willing to yes. go there. Sarah, have you yes. seen enough 14 games into the season? Well, the league knows Steph all too well, and he will be able to show up and offensively do what he's done, which, as Steve Kerr said, is basically an offense to itself. Mm. Now, the team itself, number one in defense, number two in offense. The three teams that have been top two in those categories since the start of the three-point era have all gone in to win the championship. It is very early. But if this trend continues, absolutely they're the favorite. There isn't another team out there that has the depth of experience, the skill set, that they can bring, the way that Steph opens up the floor, the coaching of Steve Kerr, like all of that comes together for me that puts them ahead of anybody else at this Jun point. Lee. Yeah, I agree with Tim and Sarah. They're my finals favorite at this point. And as good as Steph was last night, it was about the depth around Steph. It was the fact that Andrew Wiggins came through in the third quarter and was an offensive force. It's the fact that Damian Lee, Jordan Poole, and Gary Payne II are really contributing to that second unit and are making this a really, really well-grounded group of players. Now, if we turn back to Steph for a second, he's playing at another level right now where there's 13 players in NBA history who have hit more, nine or more three-pointers in three games in their career. Steph has done that three times in the last week, since last Monday. <laughs> Steph is playing on another level right now. Yeah, he's, right. he's truly playing like a generational player. And so this is a time where I think the Warriors are exceeding everyone's expectations. Draymond Green is playing better than he has and looks more engaged than he has in the last couple of years. I would be really, really afraid of the Warriors if I was the rest of the NBA. And Clint Yates. Yeah, I mean, I said yesterday in our finals preview segment that I think the team that's most likely to get back to the finals is the Warriors in this matchup. To put a finer point on what Tim was saying, in 14 games, they've outscored opponents by 124 points total in the third quarter. That number to me is staggering, and it shows me that they've gotten back to not exactly who they are in terms of the personnel, but how they play, right. which is a credit to Steve Kerr. They have kept this thing together in a way that's unbelievable. They almost got back to the playoffs last year. Now, they look like another iteration of themselves, which is kind of unfair, but it's it's true. They're the best team in the NBA right now. I don't think it's pretty You're right about who they are. As, uh, in terms of personnel, it's not there because Clay Thompson hasn't made his return. Other side of the court, Tim, you're beginning to think the Nets won't be able to work it out with the lineup without Kyrie Irving in it? No, I mean, they're also missing Joe Harris. Their lineup is a little bit of a mess right now. They got two superstars, obviously. We just don't know what to make. Look at the teams that are ahead of them with Washington and Chicago. Do both those teams have the staying power to stay up there? I feel like Chicago might. I don't know about the Wizards yet. But they're going to be in the hunt in the East, and they really just got to get their scorers going and, and get some other people back. I don't know if they'll ever get that Kyrie back, though. I think the surprise for the Nets have been their ninth in defensive efficiency, right? And I look at that as a positive because I think offensively, I think you could put things together when you have a Durant and a Harden out there. The, the loss of Kyrie is big because when Durant has a night like he did last night, un, you know, characteristically off, Harden wasn't able to take over and, and make up for it. But I think if there's any team that offensively I think will be able to figure it out over the course of the season is the Nets, um, and the defense is promising. So I, I, I'm not ready to be out on them just June, yet. this team has constituted. Does the regular season matter as much? Or you feel like once they get to the postseason, they'll be able to work things out because they do have two MVP caliber players in the court. Well, to build off of Sarah's point, I think that last night was indicative of the fact that they're walking a really thin margin of error. When Kevin Durant is not on, they need James Harden to be on. And James Harden has been inconsistent at times over the course of his career. He can have nights where he really goes off, and then he can have nights where he's not hitting his three-point, he's not drawing the fouls, he's not going to the free-throw line, and it can really affect the outcome of the next game. Last night, the Nets really needed Kyrie to be that offensive catalyst for them, and obviously he's not there right now. Without him there, uh, they're walking a really, really thin line. And Yates, last word on this. Yeah, I agree with June. This was, an, uh, this was sort of an outstanding situation for Kevin Durant. I mean, first time he shot under 40% this season. First time he's held under 20%, I mean, under 20 points. That's not going to happen again. But you need Kyrie Irving. We're watching the basketball right there. Clearly, that's a guy you need on the court to compete with the top people, the top teams in the league. His, his lack of presence yesterday was just glaring as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, he's talking about how him and Steve Nash don't talk about basketball when they talk on the – I said, what are you talking about? Get this guy on the court, man. This is a serious problem. <laughs> Would you say it's a failure right now on the Nets organization when, when, there, when that conversation isn't about basketball? Is that a failure on the Nets organization to get Kyrie Irving back on the court? I think so. I think it's up to franchises <laughs> to motivate their players to play, even though they're paying them. The point is you need these people to be out on the Sarah, court in order to make your bottom line. You seem to, to think it's more on Kyrie. Just from your face, I'm going off of. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think that Kyrie is a mercurial dude, and maybe the way to get him back is not to make him feel forced to talk about basketball being the only thing. It's to value him as a human until he feels welcomed back as a human and then a basketball player. We've been horrible. We'll move on here. Next story. No changes to the top of the college football rankings. Here's committee chair Iowa AD Gary Barta. Set aside watching the games, that's certainly a part of it, but statistically in uh, just about every category, offensively and defensively, Michigan comes out on top uh, uh, over Michigan State. Let's put that quote up, help it make some sense here. Michigan State beat Michigan head to head, but not in the standing. Sarah, do you concur with setting aside watching the games when you make a ranking for playoff standing? Set aside watching the games, because the Oregon uniforms are the cutest, but Ohio State is like a team I heard really good, so I'm going to make them number one. Um, if we wanted to set aside watching the games, we would have stuck with the BCS and used computers that tell us what the numbers say. The subjectivity of the eyeballs watching the games is something that has been repeatedly told to us is the means by which they make these rankings. So then to argue, well, we're going to ignore that for now and instead use this metric is the whole reason we're never going to be satisfied with the college football playoff rankings because too often it feels like the metric they use for one decision is not the same as another. And the other reason we're never going to be satisfied is because Cincinnati is just a perfect example of how this is just a competition between power five teams if you're going to be undefeated and you're not going to be able to set your schedule because of the way the system's set up then you have no chance so just stop pretending like everyone's got a shot and change the system yeah i think this is an instance of big conference bias if you look at cincinnati and obviously they're not playing a strength of schedule compared to a lot of the teams in the top 20 right now but they have scored more points per game than a team like Oregon. They've scored more touchdowns than a team like Oregon. So if you're going to use this logic for you know, Michigan State versus Michigan and use the statistics argument when Michigan State beat Michigan a couple weeks ago, it doesn't really make sense. There's a lot of contradiction happening here. There's not a whole lot of logic going on here. I really feel for Cincinnati right now. I think there's an underdog mentality there, and they're in prime position to jump into the top four at some point if someone falls over the course of the next couple weeks. But they deserve to be there right now. Yeah, I don't even necessarily have that big of, a, big of a problem with them being all confusing about it as long as they get it right and they get the story that everybody wants. And that's where I think Cincinnati is. As somebody who did watch the games, literally my eyeballs, I was there when Oregon trounced Ohio State. I don't think that they're that good. You know what I mean? So if you're putting in teams that nobody thinks is necessarily – uh, you know, that are always there, but there are other options and you're not doing them. It's a TV show at the end of the day. Why not make it as exciting as possible? I don't get it. Yeah, I just don't understand. There seems to be a, a difference between how they view Michigan and Michigan State based on everything he said. And then Oregon and Ohio State. Ohio State's over here scoring 59 against Purdue, which just beat Michigan State. Oregon's struggling at halftime against Washington State. But we're going to put all that aside because Oregon beat Ohio State. Okay, if you do that... Michigan State still beat Michigan. Head to head. It has to matter. I mean, it difference just has to. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. I mean, unless, until you get the transit of properties of a third game and a fourth it game, head to head has to matter the most. Head to head right here. Spain and Lee in the lead. But coming up. What happened? Where do you come down on cryptocurrency.com arena? And when's the last time you used an actual staple? The sanctity <laughs> of the staple. Yesterday. In it was supply. yesterday. Next. I like a good staple. Around the Horn is presented by Book. <laughs> Awards from the regular season that was finished a few months ago that started nearly half a year ago. Beginning now, Cy Young's tonight. Who you got? The finalists are Cole, Ray, and Lynn in the AL. Burn, Scherzer, and Wheeler in the NL. June, break it down for us. I've got Robbie Ray in the AL. I think he was consistently the best pitcher throughout the course of the season. But I got Corbin Burns in the NL because he has the best rate statistics among all the finalists, and he has the top fan grass war. Mm-hmm. Sarah? I've got Ray as well, but I've got Wheeler because of the bulk of the innings. It's so much more than his opponents, and then he's leading at least in one of the two who decide war. So I think he's going to... Who really decides war, though, Sarah Spain? Well, it's fan graphs, and it's, you know... Point to June Lee. We'll move on. It's, it's going to be Burns, and it's going to be uh, Ray. We'll move on. Scene Hall, Michigan. A million years ago, they played for the national title. Michigan won it with free throws. Anyone remember who won it? Romeo Robinson won it. This year, it was the opposite. Missed free throws. It was unranked Hall going to number four Michigan and winning 67-65. Hall coach Kevin Willard called it no upset, said he's not surprised. He expected it. Not surprised? No upset, Sarah? 
I mean, technically, if you're unranked and you beat a number four, that's an upset. But I love the approach because this is the beginning of the season. You can't peek here and tell your guys that was enough. You say, yeah, we expected it, and we're going to keep doing it. June? This is what you want out of your coach. You want a coach who's confident in you. And when you pull off an upset, you want them to be like, shrug, like move on, on to the next game. Sarah, would you call June beating you in showdown an upset? I would not call that anything. Well. I would call that an aberration. <laughs> call it reality. It just happened. June Lee, 30 seconds of pace time. Jerry Remy passed away a few weeks ago after a battle with lung cancer. Jerry was a very special person to me in that I watched his broadcast throughout my, the course of my entire childhood. He's a big reason why I fell in love with baseball and is why I'm sitting with you guys today on ESPN because he showed me that you could have fun while broadcasting a sports game and just was always funny, was always charming. And uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it was tough to see Jerry fight through the last uh, couple of years of his, of his life there. And, uh, you know, Rest in peace with Jeremy, and uh, thank you for all the laughs uh, that, that you gave us over the course of the years. Thank you for that, Drew.